جمعية دار البر تقدم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this gathering insha'Allah ta'ala, this virtual gathering where we're going to be speaking about an issue which I think all of us face in one form or another and that issue is the challenges which Muslim families face in today's world and really this title it has three parts to it we're going to be talking about challenges we're going to be talking about the Muslim family specifically. And we're going to be talking about challenges which are part of today's world. So really these challenges, some of them are things that people have always experienced, but many of them are from the Nawazi, the things which have recently began to cause problems for us or have recently appeared that perhaps were not known in that form even a few years ago. Before I actually get into the topic, I would like to extend my thanks to all that have been involved in setting up this webinar this evening. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place it in the scale of their good deeds, Yawm al Qiyamah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yu'allimana ma yanfa'una wa an yanfa'ana bima allamana wa an yazidani wa iyakum ilman wa an yuwafiqani we ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us. We ask Allah to benefit us with what He teaches us. We ask Allah to increase you and I in knowledge and we ask Allah to give you and I the ability to act upon it. So I wanted to start with an introduction and that is the nature of this world. The nature of this world is that this world is a place of tests and trials. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ we test you with something of evil and good as a trial and to us you will return. So Allah told us that the bad things that happen to us are a test and the good things that happen to us are a test. Every single problem that we go through in this life, every single challenge that we face is a test for us. And every single good thing, every ni'mah, every blessing that we are given is a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who said, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاءَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who created death and life to test which of you are best in deeds. And as long as we approach this world, as a test, that is the first step needed to be successful in that test, is to see this world as a test. This world is not your gender. It's not paradise. It's not the place where everything is perfect. It's not the place where everything works out. It is a place to be tested. And so when we approach life like that, we understand that we will face challenges. We will face difficulties. There will be problems. And some of these problems are problems which Allah Azza wa Jal, from the sunnah of Allah, sunnatullah, from the way that Allah does things, the way that Allah deals with his creation, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain things as a test for us. From the things that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions repeatedly as a test for us is al-amwal wal-awlad. Al-amwal wal awlad Your wealth is a test for you and your children are a test for you. And this test is something which presents many challenges and there are many things that we need to overcome. The second thing we need to understand is we need to understand that Islam has the solution to our problem. It's wrong to think that the solution to our problem lies outside of Islam. And that's why we see people buying self-help books, attending courses, uh, 
learning various different you know, sciences and branches, whether it be psychology or whether it be counseling, which in themselves may have benefits and harms, but it's not the same as taking knowledge from Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal sent down this Quran tibyan and likulli shay to explain every single thing that you need. So every problem and every challenge you face in your life, the Quran and the Sunnah have the answer to them and how to overcome them for the one that Allah gives the success to be able to understand. Now it's not to say that you can never benefit anything from some points that people might raise or some things that non-Muslims might say, but it's certainly, it, it's not equal at all and it's not at all the same as the benefit that you take from the Quran and the Sunnah in overcoming challenges and in dealing with the difficulties that exist in today's world. The third point that I want to raise with you is that even though we might talk about nawazil, new, new challenges, you know, challenges of today, in reality, the base of these challenges the, the asal of it, the, the core of it, the foundation of it is actually a foundation which is dealt with within Islam. So there are, there are two, two types of challenges you might see or you might come across. A challenge which is mansus, it is specifically mentioned in the Quran. The challenge of bad friends, the challenge of, for example, uh, let, for example, uh, your sins and the effect your sins have on, on your life and your family and so on. And there are challenges which might be new, like social media and uh, the internet and the connect, you know, global connectivity that might be a new problem. But the usul, the principles and the qawaid, the rules, they exist within Islam to deal with these issues. So Islam is either going to deal with the issue directly and mention it, or it's going to give you a qaida, a principle, or an asl, a foundation that you can go back to and you can, through that framework, you can understand how to overcome that challenge. So when we talk about challenges, what I have seen from the people of knowledge is typically they speak about challenges in two ways. They speak about things in a very general way, and lay a framework, and then they speak about specific challenges. And that's what I would like to do this evening, inshallah ta'ala. And then I would like to hear from yourselves, the participants, to listen to what you have to say, and inshallah for you to share with us some of the challenges that you have faced as well. So in the beginning, I want to talk about generally, I want to talk about problems in general. And I want to talk about the source of our problems. Allah Azza wa Jal said, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. Corruption has appeared on land and at sea because of what the hands of people have earned. Because of what the hands of people have earned. ليضيق عن بعض الذي عملوا so that they may taste some of what they have done. So they may come back to Allah Azza wa Jal in repentance. This ayah gives us a principle. It tells us that the calamities that happen to us in our lives, the sabab here, the cause, the worldly cause that Allah has brought about this problem because of it or this challenge because of it, is the sins that we ourselves have committed. And we commit many sins. Kullu bani adama khatta. أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وخير خطائين التواب. As the Prophet ﷺ said, all of the children of Adam frequently make mistakes, and the best of those who frequently make mistakes are those who frequently repent. So this tells us that the challenges we face, we should not look always to the outside. This is a mistake. We see people saying we face challenges because of the internet, which is challenges because of the society. We face challenges because of Fulan, this person, or because of that person. But in reality, the first reason that we face problems and challenges is ourself. It's looking at your own heart. 
and saying, you know, maybe it is the case that the challenges I face in my family, I have a share of that. I have a share of those challenges or maybe a part of those challenges is because of some of the things I have done. And I don't say that by means of or for the purpose of apportioning blame. It's your fault. Rather, I say it for what? So you understand the solution. So you understand the solution, which is وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ For you to turn back to Allah, repent to Allah, make istighfar, ask Allah's forgiveness, make changes within yourself so you can see those changes in your family. Some of the scholars used to say, I see the effects of my sin in my wife and my riding beast. Allahu Akbar. Could you imagine that? You get in your car, you switch on the engine and your car breaks down. Your car breaks down in the middle of the road. And your thought is, you know, this is the effect of my sin. This is the effect of my sin. Or you have a fight between the husband and wife. They have a fight with each other, a disagreement with each other. And you say, you know, this is not my wife's fault. This is the effect of my sin. I'm seeing the effect of my sin. Some of the scholars would say, I was prevented from Qiyamul Layl for so many years because of a sin that I did. So you see how they saw their sins to be the cause of the difficulties and challenges that they faced. And that's a very positive mindset. Don't think it's a negative one. Don't say this is a negative mindset that is making me, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm looking at myself and look and say, if you can change two things, three things, four things in your family, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change the challenges that you face and make them things that you overcome by his permission. I then want to talk about the source of problems and misguidance comes back to two things. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions them repeatedly in the Quran. The first is ash-shubuhat and the second is ash-shahawat. Shubuhat is when you become confused and you have misconceptions or false ideas. In other words, the problem is in which area? It's in your knowledge. So let's say, for example, we have a young person in the family, a teenager, and that teenager is going astray. The parents are suffering. They are making dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to correct their child and to bring peace to their family. But actually, here, we ask ourselves, what is causing this young person to go astray? It is one of two things. There is no third. لا ثالث لهما. There is no third. الشبهات والشهوات. Either there is something wrong with the knowledge. For example, the child says, I don't believe what I'm doing is haram. I don't think it's haram. I heard some sheikh say it's okay. Or I read this ayah in the Quran, I understood it's okay. They've got confusion. Or the misguidance is coming to them, external influences is coming to them from the angle of shubuhat. And they're getting confused, misconceptions, wrong ideas about Islam. The second problem is that they, they have the right idea. They know what is right and wrong. But the problem is in implementing it, and in the implementation. Their heart is calling them in one direction and their head is calling them in another direction. They have a mismatch between knowledge and action. And this is what we call shahawat desires. And there are so many places that Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about this in the Quran. From them in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ And to be honest with you, if we just took these two ayat, or three, 
and we we just took this as our topic tonight, it's enough for us. Wallah, it's enough for you. Guide us to the straight path. And we can't overcome our challenges except with Allah's help. We need Allah to guide us, to help us, to direct us to the straight path. This path is the path of whom? Sirat al an'amta alayhim. It is the path of an nabiyin wa siddiqeen wa shuhada'i wa salihin wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. It's the path of the prophets of the extremely truthful, those who are truthful in faith. The path of the martyrs and the righteous. And what an excellent group of companions they are. So this tells us about the role of the companions, which we'll come to. Don't put us on the path of the people that you are angry with. The people you're angry with. Who is Allah angry with? Or, to put a different question, why is Allah angry with them? We know who Allah is angry with because the Prophet ﷺ told us who Allah is angry with. And he told us who are dalun. But the question is why? Why? Why is Allah angry with those people? Allah is angry with them because they have knowledge. They know what is right and wrong. But they choose what is wrong instead of what is right. And Allah is angry with Abdalin because these people do not have knowledge in the first place. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. They don't know the difference. Now, if we look at these two things, there must be therefore two solutions. The solution to, and by the way, this is not the only place this is mentioned in the Quran. For example, the statement of Allah Azza Inna aradna al amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal. فَأَبَيْنَ إِنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَ مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا We offered the responsibility of Islam to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. And they declined it. They were fearful of it. And mankind took it on. He was extremely oppressive and extremely ignorant. What is oppression? Oppression is وضع الشيء Putting something in the wrong place. And you know this is wrong and you do it anyway. And what is the one who is jahul? The one who is extremely ignorant. They have confusion in the knowledge. Likewise, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. The soul is constantly commanding you and inclining you towards evil. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Whoever fears the status of Allah or fears standing before Allah and forbids their soul from its desires, Jannah will be their destination. And there are many, many, many ayat like this. طيب. What is the general solution? If this is the general problem, the general solution to shubuhat is proper knowledge taken from its proper sources. Al-ilm, the knowledge which is taken from al-rasikhina fil-ilm, the people who are firmly grounded in knowledge. When a person takes knowledge from the people who are its people, this is where they remove their shubuhat their confusion and their doubts. This is mentioned in the Quran in more than one place. But if you think about it here, I want to highlight two particular points here. I want you to highlight, it's not just about taking knowledge, but it's who you take your knowledge from. Like Ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala used to say, This knowledge is your religion. You're going to base your worship of Allah upon this. So see who are you taking your religion from. So it's about our, our children, our families. It's about them taking knowledge, yes, but also taking knowledge from reliable sources so that they don't increase in their confusion. Because this confusion comes around from two places. It comes either from not taking knowledge at all or it comes from taking knowledge from the wrong people. 
people who increase the person in confusion and cause that person to uh, become mixed up. And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوِ الْخَوْفِ أَذَاعُوا بِهِ Allah talks about the munafiqeen. He says, when there comes to them a matter of public safety and security, a matter that affects the country as a whole, they spread around, they get everybody's opinion from him and him and him. Everyone in the coffee shop is chatting about something that they have no concern with. If they returned it back to Ar Rasul, back to the messenger, and back to those Urul Amr, that those people who were in authority over them, either the authority of rulership or knowledge. What did Allah say? If you got it back to the right person, the person of knowledge would have taken out from the evidences what you need to do, they would have given it to you. And if it wasn't for the mercy of Allah and His grace upon you, you would have followed the shaitan except for a small number. This is an example of shubuhat. A person having the wrong ideas and misconceptions. And these are widespread today, which we're going to talk about, inshaAllah ta'ala. And then there are desires. The person knows. And this is a big problem, especially in Muslim countries where the level of knowledge is quite high. We are blessed in the Khalij. Wallahi, we are blessed in the Khalij in general, that the standard of Islamic knowledge among the, the young people is high. Generally speaking, you can go to some places outside of the Khalid, you can see people, you know, they don't know even the most basic how to make wudu. They don't even know the most simple of things in this religion. But generally, in many countries where we are, to, we are you know, uh, speaking to and people are listening from, the standard of knowledge is high. You know, the young kids, they know, they read Quran, they, they get Islamic lessons in school, they have knowledge. But the problem is, there is a difference, there is no practicing. The level of practicing is not there. So they are following desires, because they, and this following desires, they know it's wrong. This is what brings the anger of Allah, al maghdubi alayhim. People who had knowledge, but they didn't implement it. And people who didn't have knowledge at all. This is the core of the problem. And that's why what I'm going to say to you is that whatever we talk about today, all of it comes back to this. All of it comes back to this. So for example, the first point I want to talk about today is from the challenges in today's world is an increase in exposure to evil. And in this, the same thing I'm going to talk about. An increase in shubuhat, an increase in the ability to carry out shahawat. What do I mean? The first thing is an increase in misconceptions. We have more access to knowledge today than probably at any time in the past. And I don't mean beneficial knowledge. I mean access to information. We shouldn't say knowledge because the Sahaba had access to knowledge. And we have access to information, more information than we ever, ever had before. However, that means that our children can open up YouTube and listen to all kinds of shayateen, all kinds of devils with different misconceptions about Islam, misconceptions in extremism, misconceptions in all different areas that can lead them to become confused because of the exposure to misconceptions. Before, how would you be exposed to an extreme ideology? You would have to be in the same town or the same city or you have to walk past that person and they talk to you. Now, all their afkar come to you, their opinions come to you live to your phone. You know, your, the shubahat, they come to your mobile phone, flash, flash, update, next video, next idea, next thing, messaging services, group chats and all these different things. So what are we seeing? We're seeing an increased exposure to shubuhat. But we're also seeing an increased exposure 
to be able to carry out your desires. For example, exposure to inappropriate material online, uh, through phones and so on. Uh, the ability of someone to travel very quickly to different places and you know the, uh, what that does to your desires, uh, what that does to your, uh, any, the ability for a person to carry out the haram is greater and there's an increased exposure. The situation of society is deteriorating in every place. In every place, society is not becoming more religious. Is that not a fair comment to make? That in general, in any place in the world, society is not becoming more religious. In fact, we are seeing less religious commitment generation after generation and people after people. And this can lead to everybody being destroyed. Allah said, وَإِذَا أَرَدْنَا أَن نُهْلِكَ قَرْيَةً أَمَرْنَا مُتْرَفِيهَا فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلُ فَدَمَّرْنَاهَا تَدْمِيرًا If we want to destroy a town, we command the, those who are the evil doers to commit evil acts within it. And then the statement is established upon them and we destroy them with complete destruction. And the hadith of Zainab, Binti Jahsh, uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen, radiyallahu anha, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to her one day and he was scared. He said, La ilaha illallah, waylun lil-Arab, min sharrin qad iqtarab. He said, woe to the Arabs for an evil which is coming. Futiha al-yawma min radmi ya'juja wa ma'juja mithlu hadihi. And he took his finger like this. He said that Ya'juj and Ma'juj opened their barrier this much. And he put his finger between his thumb and his index finger like that. Zainab, she said, Ya Rasulullah, anahlik wa fina salihun. Will we be destroyed when there are still righteous people among us? Qala na'am, idha kathur al khabath. Yes, if evil spreads. If wrongdoing spreads, if filth spreads, even the righteous people can be caught up in it. So this exposure to evil is a real problem for Muslim families today. Exposure to afkar uh, al-munharifa, evil deviated beliefs, and exposure to sins and desires in a way that just wasn't there before. You know, these days, it doesn't matter even what is available in your society, even online, the amount, any haram you can imagine is available within 30 seconds. From the moment you imagine it until you find yourself in that haram is seconds. This is a new problem in today's world. It's a new problem. And it didn't used to be like that. So then the question is, what is the solution to this? There are generic solutions, but this specific problem, we have to take responsibility to limit and decrease the exposure to evil that our families get. And that is in reality through a number of points. First of all, taking responsibility. That is that the father, the head of the household, the mother, they take responsibility for what goes on in their household. Don't look outside and say someone is doing haram out there. Someone there is doing haram. First, start looking inside your own home and look at removing the munkar or decreasing it. Because Islam came for izalatul munkar wa taqliluhu. Islam came to remove evil completely and to reduce it where it cannot be removed. So you look at what is in your responsibility. مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. That is when you have authority, Sultan. You have the authority to change something. Your household, your living room. Do you not have authority to change something evil in your living room? And we wish that something will change outside. But you, in your own living room, you have sultan and you have authority in your own, in your own household 
to change some of the munkarat in your own living room, in your own household. And if you cannot remove something completely, someone says, for example, something happened at school, something happened outside, some things you cannot change, at least, at least you can reduce the exposure. Some people think of evil like a vaccine, you know, they think like a COVID vaccine, you know, they are saying like, just take a little bit and then you'll feel better. It doesn't work like that. You must remove your, the access to haram, whether it is shubuhat or shahawat, and you must reduce it where it cannot be removed. So you say, look, I cannot cut the internet. You know, at the end of the day, my children have homework and we have beneficial knowledge and we have uh, things we need work and so on. Okay, but you can supervise it and you can limit content. Put the filters to block certain types of content. Monitor what your, your family is, is exposed to, is looking at. Look for signs of exposure to haram and limit those opportunities. You know, okay, someone says, well, I have to send my kids to school. Fair enough, that is true. But you can, when they come back, you ask them, what did you learn today? What did you see from your friends today? What do you think about this or that? And through this, you end up with a degree of reducing the evil, even if it cannot be completely erased. Because at the end of the day, even a righteous family can suffer from this. The, the vast spread of evil that exists in our time. The second point that I'm going to make from the challenges of today is the speed of change. And Imam Ahmad narrates from Abi Hurairah radiallahu an that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يتقارب الزمان He said the hour will not come until time becomes close together. In other words, time speeds up. فتكون السنة كالشهر A year goes by in a month. ويكون الشهر كالجمعة And a month goes by in a week. وتكون الجمعة كاليوم And a week goes by in a day. ويكون اليوم كالساعة And a day goes by in an hour. وتكون الساعة كاحتراق الساعة and an hour goes by like the time it takes to burn a dry branch or a dry palm leaf. And in just seconds. When this happens, it means that things change very quickly. Things that were, you know, okay before become not okay. Situations that you were comfortable before, suddenly you find yourself uncomfortable. Because things are changing so quickly. Your kids are changing so quickly. One minute everything is fine, the next minute there are problems. This rapid change is a challenge that we face today. And this hadith in reality, we don't say that it has reached its peak. But what we say about this hadith is that this hadith has happened and it's getting worse. And we say, waqa'a wa yazdad. It's happened and it's getting worse. So it's already happened that time is getting shorter, shorter, shorter. But actually it's getting worse. So it feels like things are changing so rapidly. Even when it comes to technology, many parents don't understand, for example, the technology that their children use. You know, some parents think that they are really savvy with social media. They're like, yeah, I know how to use Facebook. They don't realize their children don't even use Facebook. Their children are, they're like, you know, it's okay. Some parents says, no, I know how to use Instagram. Their kids are not even using Instagram. Now they move to TikTok. Now they move to something else and something else and something else. So the point is that things are changing so quickly, the family is struggling to keep up. And this is where you must have, like they say, your finger on the pulse. You must be aware of what is happening. You must see the changes that are happening because they are visible. You can see those changes within the family, but you have to see them and identify them quickly. You can't be slow. Many times what we see is that in families, we are reactionary. We're reacting to a problem. Here's a problem. We are not ahead of the curve. So we have to be in a stage where we are keeping up with the speed of change that's happening. We're keeping up with it. That doesn't mean we have to have a, a TikTok account. Not, not necessary. But be aware if your children are using something on the phone 
or if your family is, you know, there is something going on, what is going on in school, what is, be up to date with what is happening. Because otherwise, you get caught out by the speed of change, even with, when it comes to your children growing up. Obviously, as children grow up, they need increased knowledge in certain things. You know, certain things, for example, you know, a young child at seven, eight, nine years old, there are some things they are not exposed to, not aware of. And then as they get older, there are some things which come into play and in terms of relationships and things like that. But the speed of change is so much that we often miss this change happening. So it's very important that all of us as, as a family, we are prepared for the speed with which things change in this world that we live in today. And that we are aware that what was good last week may not be good this week. And what was comfortable last week may not be comfortable this week. Because we are living in a time of taqarub zaman Time is coming so close together and changing so quickly. From the things, challenges that we face today is distance from the people of knowledge. And we can give an evidence for this, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمَ انْتِزَاعًا يَنْتَزِعُهُ مِنَ النَّاسِ Allah doesn't snatch knowledge away from the people. وَلَكِنْ يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمْ بِقَبْضِ الْعُلَمَاء But Allah takes away knowledge by causing the death of the scholars. حَتَّى إِذَا لَمْ يَتْرُكْ عَالِمًا اِتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ رُؤُوسًا جُهَالًا فَسُئِلُوا فَأَفْتَوْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَضَلُّوا أَضَلُّوا Until when Allah does not leave any scholar. That doesn't mean in the whole world. It means in that, yani for that person, the access to that person, they didn't have any body of knowledge. The people take ignorant people to give them their Islamic knowledge and they ask them questions and the people respond and give a fatwa without knowledge and they misguide themselves and others. This is a problem we are facing today more than ever which is a distance from the people of knowledge, a distance from good, authentic, reliable knowledge, taking people who should not be asked questions and asking them questions. We see today, whether it be YouTube, or whether it be other uh, you know, services or platforms, where we see people giving fatawa, these people don't have good Islamic knowledge. And yet they might have millions of people listening to what they have to say. We see situations where you have, let's say, a famous sports uh, personality or a famous uh, celebrity or a famous person. And that person is very good at whatever they do. You know, tennis, soccer, football, whatever. They're very good at it. But the people start to ask them questions because of Islam. Maybe this person is Muslim or whatever. They start to ask them questions. And then they start to give answers about things it's not their field to answer. And they misguide people. So it's extremely important that we connect our children and our families, our spouses. We connect our families to Ahlul Ilm, the people of knowledge. Ar-Rasikhuna fil Ilm, the people firmly grounded in knowledge. And I believe the job of the English speaking Da'ya is not for me to give you fatwa. My job is to connect you to the ulama. Those ulama who maybe you don't speak their language, maybe you struggle to connect with them, and maybe you need someone just to be a bridge for you to those scholars. That's our job. Because ultimately, if a person takes knowledge from the senior scholars, that person, inshallah, is going to be in a good place. If they're taking knowledge from Someone who they are taking knowledge from senior scholars, they're going to be in a good place. But if they start taking, uh, like the Prophet ﷺ said about Alamat al Sa'a, taking knowledge from Anis uh, Sagha'ir, from those people who are junior, they don't have knowledge of Islam. This is a big, big danger, and it distances a person from the religion. And then a person doesn't get knowledge, so they're full of. Shubuhat, confusion, and full of desires because there is no tazkiyah. There is no one who is guiding them to purify their heart, nor is there anyone with knowledge to answer their misconceptions. 
We need to encourage our families to seek Islamic knowledge. Make our houses places of knowledge. Walillah, alhamd, the same things we are saying are dangers are also benefits. The access to knowledge today online, the access to knowledge through Zoom, through YouTube, through different services and platforms is so easy to get access to. But still, we see people have this issue of tatabu al gharaib. They want to look for something strange and weird and different. But in reality, the knowledge of Islam is not gharib, it's not strange and weird. The knowledge of Islam is simple and clear. And so taking that knowledge from reliable sources, this is extremely important. And understanding this is the reason we have marital problems, it's the reason of issues between husband and wife. It is a lack of Islamic knowledge or a lack of practicing. Shubuhat shahawat. Either shubuhat, the husband says, I don't have to treat my wife right because she doesn't treat me well. This is a shubha, confused. Or someone knows they're supposed to treat their wife well, but he doesn't do it. So this is again bringing people back to Islamic knowledge. And especially the knowledge related to Iman and the knowledge of Allah, knowing Allah and knowing his names and attributes. This has a profound effect upon a person. The knowledge of Aqeedah of Iman, it has a big effect upon a person. It really makes a person fear Allah and makes a person want to correct themselves and be scared. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ They're scared of what? They're scared of Allah. They're scared of Allah's names and attributes. They're scared of standing in front of Allah يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ So this only comes around from what? From Talab Al-ilm al-shara'i, seeking beneficial Islamic knowledge. From the challenges we have today are negative influences from friends, society, and social media. And this is not something unusual. Rather, this is something mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's also mentioned in the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilih, falyanzur ahadukum man yukhalil. A person is upon the religion of their close friend. So let everyone look at who they took as a close friend. And this is particularly dangerous because most of us live in societies where we have also, not only we have uh, Muslims of different levels, practicing, not practicing, but we also have many non-Muslims in our society, uh, living in our society among us as our neighbors, as uh, you know, people in our workplace. It's very easy to become negatively influenced by those around you. So you really have to choose your close friends. Now, we're not talking about being kind. Being kind, this is part of Islam. Being kind, being just to everybody, giving a good impression of Islam. That's not what we're saying here. We're talking about who is your close friend that you are mixing with, that you are emulating that you want to be with that person, that you are sharing your feelings with them and they are sharing with you. This should be somebody who is not only Muslim, but is practicing the religion properly. Because the influence, it's your religion that will suffer. Al-mar'u ala dini khalili. A person is upon the religion of their close friend. فَلْيَنظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِ Look, who did you take as a close friend? Allah spoke to us about the influence of bad role models. Surah Al-Furqan. On the day when the oppressive person will bite on their hands, they will say how I wish I took with the messenger away. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Woe to me. How I wish I didn't take this person as my friend. They misguided me from the remembrance of Allah after it came to me. And shaitan always deserts mankind. The shaitan always deserts mankind. So when we think about the effect of bad role models, we think about the effect of our friends upon us. The effect of peer pressure. Abi Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu an he narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْجَلِيسِ الصَّالِحِ وَجَلِيسِ السُّوءِ 
كحامل المسك ونافخ الكير ونافخ الكير he said the example of a righteous companion and a bad companion is like the perfume seller and the blacksmith فحامل المسك the person who is the perfume seller either he is going to give you from the perfume or either you're going to purchase from him or you're going to have a nice smell three situations from a good friend either number one that person gives you something you don't give anything back or you give them and they give you and you exchange benefits or even if nothing happens at least just by being around them you get a good reputation a good feeling a good smell as for nafikh al the blacksmith imma an yahrik thiyabak either he's going to burn your clothes wa imma an tajida minhu rihan rihan muntina Either this person is going to burn your clothes or a horrible smell is going to come to you. If you're hanging around the blacksmith and they're blowing on the fire, either the sparks come and burn your clothes and you get harmed directly or the bad smell is there. Even if you're not harmed, but that sum'a, the, the, the reputation is all gone. And the, the, the honor that you had is all gone because of your association with that person. Now someone says, okay, how do I make this change for myself and my family? We say, first of all, you yourself. Look at who your close friends are. Look at who you spend your time with. It's not about any just, uh, his name is Abdullah Muhammad Fatima Maryam. You yourself, who are you spending time with? How are they in their deen, in their ibadah, in their ilm, in their akhlaq, their manners? How are they in their influence of you and your influence of them? When it comes to those that you have authority over, like your children, you encourage good friends and discourage bad ones. So when it comes to the good friends, they can spend some extra time. They can take some extra day, uh, you know, a day off or half a day to go to see them. You can give them benefits and you can give them allowances. But when it comes to the bad friend, we cut that option off. No, you can't go and see them. No, you can't spend time with them. Because that person is having that negative effect. And don't say, I'll give them da'wah. Don't say, I'll give them da'wah. Yes, you'll give, inshallah, everybody da'wah. But when you keep someone as a close friend, ultimately, their influence will rub off on you like the perfume seller or the blacksmith. So if the person you're with is a perfume seller, whatever you're going to do with them, at least you're going to smell good. And if the person is a blacksmith, even if they are so careful not to hurt you, you're still going to smell when you come home. Two or three more challenges I'm going to mention, then we're going to take some questions. First of all, being busy and having less time together. We see families, Allah, like, not even communicating. And they communicate by text message, you know, like by WhatsApp. Just even, they just, they don't see each other. You know, like the father is busy working, maybe mom is working or, or, or whatever it might be, or she's out a lot. The kids are, you know, home and the kids home and straight out again. Uh, school is a pressure for them. Work is a pressure for the parents. And the family is not spending time together. Not spending time together means that the ties of the family become weak. And that's why Islam puts so much emphasis on silatul rahim, keeping good ties with your family. The in the hadith in which Allah Azza wa Jal is, is, says to the ties of relatives, would you not be content that whoever keeps ties with you, I will keep ties with them. And whoever breaks ties with you, I will break ties with them. What do you think if you turn away from this religion? You will cause corruption on the earth and cut off your family ties. Making good ties with family, spending time together, putting the gadgets away and the phones away and spending quality time with each other. Children learn most from their parents. And ultimately, if that time is taken away, this is a big problem. 
Also from the challenges we have are differences between different generations. Because as time moves on, things change. And it becomes, you know, there is a generation gap between the older people and the younger people. And this really, it comes back to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَيْسَ minna, not from us, is the one مَنْ لَمْ يُوَقِّرْ كَبِيرَنَا وَلَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. He said, not from us are those who do not honor those who are older and have mercy on those who are younger. So what does that mean? From the younger person to the elder person is having respect for them. Tawqeer. Having respect for them. And taking from their wisdom. And appreciating that they have knowledge that didn't come to that person in terms of experience in life and wisdom and so on. But also from the elderly towards the young, having mercy towards them. Understanding that things do change and there will be differences, but if we give good Islamic knowledge, that will be the foundation upon which we can deal with these issues that come about. And from the points that I want to mention, I'll make this the last one to leave time for question, is a loss of identity. This is one of the great challenges we face in today's world a loss of our Islamic identity. There are many reasons for that, mostly a lack of Islamic knowledge, also exposure to many, like this global world, and exposure to different people, religions, cultures. For example, we live here in a very multicultural city, many different cultures, different people living together. But what it can do if we don't hold on to our Islamic etiquettes and behaviors, what can happen is we lose our Islamic culture. We lose our identity as a Muslim. And the identity, we even lose our cultural identity. Even if it's not Islam, we lose our culture as well. We lose the things that we used to hold dear, that used to make us who we were because of either a lack of Islamic knowledge or too much exposure to the world and not filtering what you see from it. So no problem if, if yeah, something good comes to you from outside and you know at the end of the day, you benefit from that. But what we see is people taking everything, just absorbing everything. And in the end, it causes them to lose their identity. And so we, we, we say to somebody, what is your identity made of? This identity, what is it? Who are you? First and foremost, you are a Muslim. And that means certain things. It has a deep meaning. It doesn't mean your name is Abdullah and Fatima, Maryam. You are, you are a Muslim. You're someone whose identity Allah has given it to you. Allah Azza wa Jal named you Muslim. He gave you an identity. And then within that Muslim identity, you also have your Muslim culture. Al-Muru'a, Al-Adab, Al-Akhlaq, the etiquettes of a Muslim, the behavior of a Muslim, the Muru'a, the culture that you live in, the Adat and Taqalid, the culture, the Muslim culture that you live in. I'm talking about from outside of Islam, the Muslim culture that you, that you are a part of. Don't lose it and don't allow your family to lose it. Preserve these things, pass them from generation to generation so that people know their Muslim identity. And then they will be comfortable to interact with a non-Muslim. Because when they're interacting with a non-Muslim, they're interacting and they are comfortable with who they are. But if I'm going to go and interact with a non-Muslim and I don't have a strong Muslim identity and Muslim culture, what is going to happen? I'm going to end up lose, absorbing from them what is not pleasing to Allah and I'm going to lose who I really am. So it's very important that we connect ourselves to Islam reading the Qur'an, the hadith, reading the biographies of the great people who came before, the seerah, the great scholars of Islam, the great figures and, and, and the great imams of Islam, the Prophet Wasallam, the Sahaba, and so on. Reading those things that inspire us to develop our Muslim identity and holding fast to al-adab, wal-akhlaq, wal-muru'a, our uh, etiquettes and customs and cultures that are connected with the religion of Islam. To be honest, I had to go a little bit quick at the end to skip through quite a lot of points. 
uh, it's a big topic. But I want to leave, I, I guess we can extend a little bit, we can just scrape a little bit more time for, for questions, inshallah. Let's try to, to get some questions from the audience. Wa jazakumullahu khayra. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. The first question is, a sister asks, how can a practicing Muslim family give recreational outlets to their kids since they don't watch TV or have screen time? And also, how can they monitor their kids when the kids go and play with their uh, neighbors, kids who are non-practicing Muslims? Mm. So first of all, the first uh, part of the question, how can we give recreational time? So I believe one of the things we are truly blessed with, and I'm not sure if everyone here is, is based in, in the Emirates, but one of the things we are truly blessed with here is massive opportunities to do a wide variety of things. And it's very possible to choose the right time and place to be able to do a lot of activities, whether it's outdoors, whether it is a beneficial lecture that you choose for your child to watch or an activity you go to take part in. It's really about curating what you, what you allow them to do. Not saying, here's the world, pick anything you want, but saying, okay, you know, let's go to this place and let's choose the right time to go there. Because when you have a place that is open for everybody, for sure, and you have to choose the right times to do something. Uh, let's choose the right time, the right day, you know, the right company to go with. But there are so many opportunities, especially going out, you know, going outdoors where possible, letting the kids spend time with the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. There are beautiful opportunities. And I think everywhere in the world is like that if you look for those opportunities. That's the first thing. So curating, not just opening the door to go anywhere, but choosing where am I going to go? Where, what time is it suitable? Who shall I go with? That's the first thing. In terms of monitoring your kids, there are two options. The first thing is in terms of technology, of course, monitoring means some uh, you know, suitable technological solutions for keeping an eye, for example, uh, Apple's uh, screen time, Android's, uh, Google's uh, family uh, app, which allows you to kind of monitor what your kids are doing and how much time they're spending and things like that. As for outside, one of the most important things you can do is number one, give your kids a framework of principles so they understand who is a good friend, who is a bad friend. And number two, watch and observe them because the bad friend will have a bad influence. You will smell the smell of the blacksmith upon them. So when the child comes back and you start to see some bad behaviors, you realize that bad behavior came from this particular child in the park or so on. And talk to your children about what they see. Talk to them about, okay, what happened in the park today? Or there was this boy, he said some bad words. Okay, well, do you know that the Prophet said, the Muslim is not la'an and ta'an. We don't use bad language and we don't use, uh, we don't use curse words. And so you talk about things like that with your children. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Yeah. Uh, two similar questions. Uh, sister asks an advice for a father who's too busy and ends up on the mobile phone while at home and also does not spend time with kids. And another mother asks, how do we uh, de-addict children from mobile phones? Mm. So with regard to a busy father, I think it's really important for uh, his wife and his kids to gently talk to him. You know, not, because when you're speaking to someone in authority, you, you have to speak to them in a certain way. You, know, you can't be rude, you can't be crude with them, but you can be, you know, really talk to him and say, look, why don't we make a time where we all put our phones away? And at the end of the day, the business is still there half an hour later, you know, whoever is calling. You know, generally speaking, most of us, our work is not as critical as we think it is. You know, we think that our work is, is utterly critical and time sensitive, but everybody needs to take some time and need to switch off. So having a culture of putting your phone away when you come in the house, even if it's even if it's just the dinner table, like when we're going to sit down and eat together, we have one rule. All the phones, put them on the side. And you know, subhanAllah, that could make a big difference to a person. Just that brings the person, give some time. And if that doesn't work, try outdoor activities where you can't easily bring your phone. Like try to get them to do something, you know, where they like do something together as a family, where you're not going to be sat on, on the phone, for example. That's something. Uh, 
In terms of children and mobile phones, I personally think if you can avoid giving them, you know, avoid it. If you must give them, then make sure you have appropriate parental controls and appropriate screen time. So for example, uh, if it's an Apple device, you have that screen time. If it's an Android device, you have something, I think it's called a uh, family link, something like that, where basically you can monitor the device, the screen time, what time has been spent. So do that in a controlled the use. Say to them, for example, you can take your phone uh, at this time. You cannot take your phone at that time. Restrict the apps which are available. You cannot have this. You cannot have this. You cannot have this. So that there is some degree of, of control. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself, do they really need that phone? I mean, when they're going to turn a certain age, they're going to have one anyway. So do you really need to give them at 12, at 13? That's a question to ask. Now. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. The next question is, how and when to ed educate children about shubuhat and shahwat that are taught in schools? For example, shubuhat, evolution theory, shahwat, sexual education. Mm. So there are... There are a number of things to talk about when it comes to this kind of issue. The first thing is we have to try to preempt the problem. It's not good to be reactionary. It's not good that the kid comes home and like, oh, we've learned about, uh, you know, sort of intimate relationships in school. And then, you know, the parent is left kind of like, ah, uh, okay, let me. But rather a, a progressive age appropriate teaching, which goes with step by step even from quite a young age. So in the beginning, for example, at a very young age, we teach our children the importance of the aura, right? Like, for example, uh, you have like a four-year-old, a five-year-old child. You don't allow them to uh, uncover their aura. And no, you must keep covered. No, you must put that uh, this back on, uh, put your you know shorts back on, put your T-shirt back on, whatever it might be. This in itself is teaching haya, it's teaching modesty to the children. Maybe the children see somebody in the street who is not properly dressed. They say, why was the person wearing like that? We say, for example, this is not our Islamic dress and it's not allowed. And in fact, where do boys have to cover? Boys must cover from the belly button to the knee. And where do girls have to cover? And we teach them like that at an age appropriate way. For example, when they are maybe let's say, uh, you know, older than that, they learn how to make ghusl. Even if they haven't had the causes of ghusl, they don't know about uh, wet dreams and all this type of stuff, but they, they understand how the physical, how to make ghusl, for example. Step by step by step, age appropriate, trying to be ahead of the curve. As for shubuhat, I think that there are two issues. I think in a way, the, the danger with teaching shubuhat early is that you put the shubha into the person's mind. So what happens is you actually give the person the confusion before they heard it. But if, for example, the child is taught that we were created from Adam and all of us are children of Adam, then when the child hears that we are not children of Adam, what will the child do? Instinctively, the child will come back and say, something told me wrong at school. They told me we are not from Adam. Now you can answer the question. But with shubuhat, you must be very careful that you can answer. If you can't answer, you take the child to someone of knowledge and have them answer. Because the half-baked answer is just as bad as the shubha. Is the half-baked answer where you get 50-50. You know, you get like, well, uh, no, you know, it's... Um, and, and you give them the wrong answer to it. So this, I believe, is very important. Shahawat, teach them step by step according to Islamic teachings with modesty according to an age-appropriate way, and that way they will have understood. For example, we in, you know, in, in fiqh, many issues are dealt with which are issues of intimacy and uh, sensitive issues. But subhanAllah, those issues don't affect us. Why? Because we are studying it in fiqh. And it's, like, it's just like part of our teaching. Okay, we understood about this issue, this issue. And we try to preempt. With the shubuhat, we give them the general Islamic knowledge before they get exposed. And when they come back and say, I heard something which goes against it, if we're able to answer, we answer. And if not, we take them to someone who can answer. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. The next question is a bit long, but I think it, uh, I'll go through the details, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. I live in the UK and I have children aged five and three. Alhamdulillah, we teach them celebrations such as Halloween and Christmas or Haram. 
we don't celebrate or follow this the issue i'm having is when we go out to a supermarket for example and when we see the de- uh, when they see the decorations they shout out christmas is haram or we don't celebrate christmas sometimes mm-hmm. people especially non muslims hear this today they came home and their neighbors uh, had Hall- halloween decorations all over their house and the five year old was slightly upset the question is what is the best method to deal with this in the home and with young kids i try to explain it to my children that we don't celebrate this and and also we do not shout out haram in public but they are very small perhaps i'm doing something wrong exposure here is everywhere so they are naturally curious hope hope this makes sense mm-hmm. zakla khair so it's a very very good question and it's a very difficult balance to strike uh first of all it's really important as we said to have a muslim identity and that means when we see something that goes against our muslim identity whether it is uh, another religion a practice of another religion or the culture of a people which goes against islam then we explain to our children that this is not part of our culture this is not part of our religion for example if it's a if it's a religious issue or if it's not if it's just like for example bad manners or bad dress or whatever we teach the children that this is not part of our religion in terms of children instinctively re- reacting that this is haram or this is bad that in itself is not that big of a problem but you want to slowly guide them towards understanding the rules of inkar al munkar because islam has got rules and principles of how you respond to an evil uh, and it's of course we don't expect 3 and 5 years old to have a good understanding of it but we do say okay is it something we are allowed to change it are we for example am i allowed to go to the the store and rip down the christmas tree and throw it in the bin i'm not allowed right i would get in trouble for that right like if we explain to the child we say look what would happen if i took that tree and i threw it in the bin what would happen the police would come i would get in trouble it's not allowed for me okay so do i have the knowledge to be able to speak about it and tell people why it's wrong maybe business as well at this moment i don't have the knowledge to do that uh, i know it's not allowed but i don't have like it's not the right situation for me to go and and you could i mean we've seen situations where it is the right you can go to the store and say to the muslim owner of the store for example look you know this is not part of our religion maybe you shouldn't sell it but say jazakallah khair and you know what it is your right actually we shouldn't and they they do it like that that could be and the third situation is what do you do if you don't have the ability to change with your hand nor do you have the ability to speak about it with your tongue so what should you do now you have to hate it in your heart and that doesn't mean shouting around and shouting at everybody but actually hating it in your heart and saying i wish this would not exist and i don't want to be a part of it i want to be distant from it and inshallah if we teach them like that in a way that they can understand they will get the habit the habit but we don't want to say to them you know like No no don't say it's haram you know people might get upset at the end of the day islam is not like that and if something is wrong it's wrong but we teach them how do you behave when you see something wrong what is going to help things to change for example we have a discussion and we say what do you think would help people to change say what well, if they became muslim it's very true so should we maybe help to share the message of islam to people so that people would not then celebrate those things would that be a good way of stopping it yeah that would be so we talk like that and they understand about how to deal with something wrong when you see it uh, do you have the ability to change it do you have the knowledge and the right situation to speak to somebody about it because do you think that shouting out at somebody haram haram is going to make them change probably not so now the question is what how do we speak to somebody or who should we speak to and then finally if that doesn't work then ask if i you know i hate it in my heart i really don't like it and so on so then i look at ways to to make changes in my you know in my community and one of the ways is by sharing islam uh, with people so that they accept islam and they move away from these things and allah knows best jazakallah khair shek a sister asks i keep pushing my family to islam to, uh, to listen to islamic talks online via zoom or she keeps sending them links but they always make excuses so she's asking whether she should stop sending them now as she's tried several times and they don't participate you know one of the nature of dawa 
that we learned from the prophets والسلام, is that people don't always listen to your da'wah. And if people don't listen to your da'wah, my recommendation is that you read Surah Nuh. Nuh remained with his people 950 years. In that 950 years, alayhi salatu wasalam, he called his people. And only a tiny number accepted Islam. Very small number of people accepted Islam. What did Nuh do? He varied his da'wah. Inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara. I called my people in the night and the day. ثُمَّ إِنِّي أَعْلَنْتُ لَهُمْ وَأَسْرَوْتُ لَهُمْ إِسْرَارًا In another part of the surah, I called them out publicly and I spoke to them privately. So being able to vary your options. If you found one option didn't work for you, maybe then look at another option. Summarize the lecture and send like some little bonus points. Some people don't like long lectures, but they just want the little clips, you know, like you send them the little mini clips, 30 seconds long. The person benefit from it. But even if you're finding none of that is working, don't stop completely. Just vary your method. Because ultimately in Dawah, the Prophet saw so many people he spoke to didn't accept from him. So you shouldn't expect that everybody will accept from you, but you do have to vary your methods to find the right method for the right person and Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. A sister asks a question that in their family they have a sister who is insisting on marrying a brother who has been expo who has exposed her to the views of uh, she mentioned certain names of uh, deviant and extremist speakers, and uh, he reads books which speak against senior scholars, and the brother also has uh, anger issues. So now she says her family does not have valid grounds for not accepting this marriage. Can her family stop this marriage? Is the question. Absolutely. I, I, I think in these issues, you have to understand that the answer I'm going to give is based on the question. Why am I giving this disclaimer? Because in reality, we don't like, and, uh, until I see this person in front of my eyes and I see what they are reading and who they are listening to, I will not understand properly. But if there is a situation where there is a brother who is exposed to deviant beliefs and deviant individuals. This is, uh, this is from the most important reasons to stop someone from getting married. Because ultimately that person is going to become the head of the household for that woman. And that person is going to be responsible for her. And that deviancy is going to affect her and her children. And some of this deviancy is very dangerous. Yani. It's very dangerous. It can cause huge problems to a person in their belief in terms of shubuhat and confusion in terms of the way they practice the religion. So I think a person having deviant beliefs is extremely, an extremely good reason for a family to decline marriage. With the disclaimer that I can't speak about any individual person without knowing the circumstances of the issue in front of me, but based upon the question, it's absolutely a good reason. And that's has to be explained to the sister. You see, the thing is, there is a, there is a hikmah in having a wali, right? In having a, a, her father validate, you know, who she marries or, or approve who she marries. And that is that, yes, you know, uh, often a young girl, you know, she uh, is, you know, she's, she likes the person. He has good qualities. I mean, I'm not saying he's all bad. He has good, some good qualities. And she likes that and she sees that who else will marry me and it's a good match for me. And she's not thinking independently. So for the wali to come and say, look, this person is not a good person for you. I'm not stopping you from marrying somebody. I'm stopping you because of this individual and the harm that they could cause upon a person. It's very, very important. So I believe it is absolutely valid. Just according to as, you know, as the question was asked and Allah Azza wa knows best. Zakallah <laughs> Sheikh. Uh, we, are, we are out of time, but do you think we can take some questions? Yeah, we can take some more questions. Okay. A brother asks, what do you recommend to a married couple who have differences of opinions and lo have lost the respect and intimacy towards each other? How should they approach to resolve their differences? Allah Azza wa said, 
ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون سورة الروم From the signs of Allah is that he has created from you spouses so that you may find tranquility with living together with them and he's placed between you affection and mercy and in this there are signs for a people who reflect Think about this ayah a lot Allah tells us that it's Allah that places love and mercy and that you have to have mercy with each other. Spouses have to be merciful towards each other and forgiving of each other's faults and kind towards each other and affectionate towards each other. And ultimately the goal is that the husband and wife provide sakina to each other, tranquility. And you go home from your busy day and you feel relaxed. You know, I feel comfortable. When that breaks down, there are solutions. And one thing I would strongly recommend is we have a series called The Muslim Family. It's on the Al Madrasatul Umariya AMAU uh, YouTube channel. And we, in detail, we spoke about the relationship between husband and wife. And we also spoke about when that relationship goes wrong, what are some of the means in order to correct the difficulties within that relationship. I think that could be a good place to start. But this ayah, really, if there are ayat, if you think about it, this ayah in Surah Al-Rum, very carefully, Wallah, there are many, many things in this ayah that if you think about it, it would, it would go a long way towards helping you to solve the problem, inshallah. And Allah knows best. Zakallah khair, Shaykh. An important disclaimer, a lot of questions might not be asked, so we don't want uh, the attendees to feel upset about it. Uh, we just have limited time and a uh, lot Absolutely. of questions. Uh, let's take one last question, sir. Absolutely, take one okay. question. A sister says, if the spouse is not a practicing Muslim and doesn't support in taking the kids to the masjid classes, etc., how to handle this situation with wisdom? Well, if the spouse is not practicing, I think there are two really important things need to be done. The first thing is that that sister needs to take the burden on her shoulder as much as she can. So the spouse is not taking the kids to the masjid, let her take the kids to the masjid where she can. Let her encourage the children with beneficial videos or lectures or programs to take part in or courses and things like that. Because sometimes the spouse is not doing it out of ignorance. I mean, they don't know the value of it. So I'm not saying that they are like stopping her, but they are just not helping her. So make sure that she takes her responsibility so when she answers before Allah, she will say that I have, I have discharged my responsibility. I did whatever I could. And the second thing is to work on improving and, and helping the spouse to improve. Because if that spouse improves, the whole family will improve, inshallah ta'ala. And a woman has an ability to do this that maybe she doesn't realize. There is a hadith the Prophet Sallallahu spoke about some of the deficiencies that a woman has. And in some of the narrations, he said, he said along the lines of, in the meaning, close to that meaning, that she can overcome the strongest of men, even with her flaws. Why? Because she, when she is affectionate to her husband and she's good to him, and she shows him love and care and she fulfills his rights, he becomes like a small child in her hand. He becomes like a small child and she can really have a big influence on him. And I know it's hard when he's distant from the religion and you know he's not engaging with the kids, but if she treats him really, really well, he will become like a small child in her hand. And she will be able to help him and direct him towards what will bring him goodness in this world and the next, inshaAllah ta'ala. I think that's what we have time for. I do apologize to anyone who didn't get their question answered. Uh, we tried to answer as many as we could, but the time was limited. Uh, that is the nature of these uh, online events. That is what Allah made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best.